All right, everyone, welcome to the Disability Dish, the UML Perspective. This is our first episode. We are so excited. My name is Chanel Diaz. I am a co-host and also an assistant director in Disability Services. And I'm going to turn it over to my co-host. Hi there, I'm Jody Rachens, and I'm the new director of Disability Services here at UMass Lowell. And I'm really excited for you to join us today and you'll have to bear with us as this is our first podcast experience. Um, I wanted to share that one really major initiative for the Disability Services Office sort of moving forward is to utilize our collective skills to reach the community beyond accommodations for students with disabilities. So we wanna openly and actively discuss ways in which we can support our disability community members, whether it's within the university or outside networks or in everyday lives. Um, it's important and impactful to make a major effort to reduce stigma and shame around disability. We are gonna to work towards flipping the script to highlight the uncountable strengths that show through various disabilities. So among the various initiatives that we plan to put out over the next few years in our office, we're rolling out this monthly podcast to provide representation and discussion around various interesting topics on disability. So we're gonna be covering a whole bunch of topics uh, coming up, um, including sort of what makes a change agent, what access actually means, and a whole bunch of other topics that may include the university and may not, just kind of whatever we find interesting. Um, so today in our inaugural episode, we have two very brave first guests to talk with us um, on topics of disability. And today we're going to talk about how disability is portrayed in the media and our societal understanding around invisible and hidden disabilities. And Janelle's going to give us a little disclaimer before we give our introduction. Story. Yeah. So we just want everyone to know, listeners and our guest speakers, this is just a discussion conversation, um, your opinion, your perspective on these episode topics. So we just wanted to put that out there that there's kind of no wrong or right. This is just your perspective um, on the topic. Um, without further ado, I'm going to have our first guest speaker introduce themselves, um, which I'm going to start with Amy. Hi everyone, thank you so much for tuning in today. My name is Amy Liss. I serve as the Director of Multicultural Affairs at UMass Lowell. Love working here, love our students, um, and I use a she and they pronouns. Next up is Lauren. Hi, I'm Lauren. I'm a junior at UMass Lowell and I am president of Disable the Label, um, the club. Lauren, do you want to share a little bit about Disable the Label? Give a plug while you're sure. here. So Disable the Label is a social club that connects students with and without disabilities. And we're trying to build a community on campus where people can feel comfortable um, talking about their struggles on campus, whether they have a disability or not. Fantastic. Awesome. So I guess just kind of start the conversation, if each of you can kind of just talk to me about what the word disability, what kind of relationship you have with the word disability, if any, um, and what that means to you. Doesn't matter who, anybody can go first. <laughs> I really appreciated when you offered this question because I think about, I came from a generation where the word handicapped was used and I was trying to remember when language shifted and when that evolved and even talking now to say somebody who experiences a disability has a disability um, because for a long time after we moved from handicap, it was a disabled person and so the focus was not on the person and losing humanity um, for any individual. and what that feels like and what the implications are, whether you hear that word in the media or in an educational mm -hmm. setting, just thinking about how language might impact, you know, how somebody thinks about the topic. For sure. Um, when this question was asked to me, I honestly didn't really know what it meant, like to have a relationship yeah. 
with a word. Um, hmm. But I feel like that that word to me is very stigmatized on like what you're supposed to look like or what you're supposed to act like if you have a disability. Uh, oftentimes people think it looks like one thing, but as we know that there's a variety of different disabilities and experiences people go through with having it. So I think the word is very vague but at the same time has a very specific definition from society. Fantastic. And what do you feel like um, society's impact has on that word or maybe even like the media? I, I think society, well, they have the ability to change the way the public thinks about a word because oftentimes in media people's opinions are altered based on what they see or um, how it's presented in for example the news or a movie um, people might see a disability and think that's what everyone looks like when they have that particular disability but they also have the power to say even though this is one example of how somebody's life might be with this disability. That's not the case for everyone. So I think they hold the power to um, to kind of show how disability can be different. Sometimes that power is not always used to the best of their advantage. Well, and I think Lauren brings up a really good point around the way that media will help to really shape public opinion and what that looks like. And I think about, you know, we have a word or a phrase that's used and how then that's used in the media, then how people think about that word and then how public opinion will shape policy or shape lit litigation or shape a law or thinking about, you know, we're in an education system, but that can also apply to healthcare systems, um, you know, any number of systems that we apply to. Um, or a part of. And so when we think about our language, what's the individual impact in your classroom, in your community, in your friend group, but what does that look like on a larger scale and sometimes without us even realizing that that impact is growing and growing more broadly. Mm -hmm. And I think it's something you both have touched on, which is that there are so many different types of disabilities that it's nearly impossible for the media to encompass all of it and, as Lauren said, even within one diagnosis or one category, it is such a humongous spectrum of sort of presentation and experiences for people. Um, disability as an identity is sometimes an enormous a part of somebody's identity and sometimes it's a medium part of their identity and sometimes it's barely a thought of part of their identity or it ebbs and flows, it's really kind of fluid. And so it's really interesting because Janelle and I have been talking a lot about how um, there is a lot going on in kind of TV shows and movies lately where there really is a, a greater effort to include um, different disabilities kind of right on the, you know, right on the screens that we're watching. And, um, you know, I, I sent out this little, this newsletter from our office and one of my favorite pages is, um, you know, kind of thinking about, you know, the show everyone's talking about station 11 has some disability representation and um there's yeah i didn't put on there but there's a show atypical that just wrapped up that um you know has some really interesting trajectories around an entire family and their relationship with somebody who at the center has a disability but their own kind of stuff going on as a family and, um hbo has the the sex lives of lives of college girls which is a, a, a hilarious comedy by mindy kaling and there is um, some, they did an interesting job with that one because there's a, a, a famous kind of social media influencer who she's, um, she, I think she has ALS um, and she is in a, in a wheelchair, but they never talk about it. She's just a character who goes to college and she's like really confident and she, you know, it has nothing to do with her having a disability and she's just in the show and it's like pretty cool because she's just doing her thing as an actress in the show. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm curious what you all think in terms of what you're seeing and kind of, um, 
you know, if you're feeling like it's doing a, a, a good job, if it's not doing a good job or kind of mixed, you know, what you all think of sort of how, what you're seeing out there in your couches. <laughs> You say it, Lauren. Yeah. Take it or Amy. Amy. I didn't know if you wanted I'm to say sorry. anything, Lauren. Um, <laughs> it broke up right when you <laughs> said that. So, oh. uh, yeah. Okay. Um, so, I actually wrote a paper on a TV show Aww. last semester in my disability and literature class um, about Ooh. the good doctor. It's it's a show controversial yeah. <laughs> it's a show where um the main actor he doesn't actually have autism in real life but he plays a surgeon who has autism and i i s argued in the paper that he did overall like a good job but also there were issues like with him not actually having the disability, you can't fully mm -hmm. understand how to play a character with a disability if you don't experience that. I mean, you can try to do a really good job and he would talk to people that had the disability to try to gain more understanding. But at the same time, it's really not the same. And I, and I also argued in the paper, which this is just my opinion, we talked about the term in the class, inspiration porn. And so mm -hmm. in that show, it yeah. shows that, yes, as a person with a disability, you can be extremely successful, like as a surgeon, uh, oftentimes that job role is looked at as wow you really made it you're super mm -hmm. successful in life but at the same time that's not always that's not always like reality yeah. thank you <laughs> <laughs> um like um, some times people with disabilities do have struggles and they can't accomplish that surgeon mm -hmm level and that's okay but I think some of that show is is trying to show like yes just because you have a disability you can accomplish amazing things in life which is true but you might not always be able to reach that level of being like a surgeon um, so that was just my opinion from observing that show and being a fan of that show, I do enjoy it. Um, so I thought that was interesting when that question came up for the podcast. I immediately thought of that show in the paper that I wrote for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think something that you're both of you are reminding me about, I came from a generation that if you had a character with a disability on your screen from a fictional standpoint, that was the storyline. Like, I can't even think of a single character who, um, you know, may have had a disability or shared somehow through, um, you know, screen or script about a disability that that was not the central point. That there was never really a story beyond, you know, the disability is the story. That's the plot point that will be focused. So I think from that perspective, maybe media is doing a better job at expanding representation in that way. Um, but I also don't think I can probably say like, oh, it's great that would feel false and inauthentic. The first thing I can think of was in was it the 80s, like Corky and Life Goes On, who had Down syndrome, was the first time he was like a part of the family and not like the, the main, main thing, but he was a, a part of the family. And I feel like that was a very, very big deal um, when they included an MP, it was an actor with Down syndrome. I think that was really big, big news. I could say that, like, personally, as somebody who identifies as having a physical disability, I was trying to think about, like, the first time I ever kind of saw disability portrayed in the media, it was, like, mm. Tiny Tim, right? Like, from the Christmas Carol. Um, and, like, now I can say, like, I was trying to think of, like, when did I see something else? And I was like, well, you know what I've been thinking about? 
invisible disabilities, right? Like you're just thinking about physical disabilities. And so currently right now, you know, now we're trying, now we're starting to see kind of more of the invisible and the physical being portrayed, which is kind of nice, right? Um, but I 100% agree with you, Lauren, that that's not always the reality in terms of, you know, the whole inspiration um, porn thing in terms of like, you're idolizing this character because they have struggled and they are doing so well and being successful, but that's not the case for everyone. Not everyone has access to be the best they can be, right? Um, Cause there's a lot of different kind of- Right. And even in real life, facing. somebody who may be a skilled um, enough to be a surgeon, there's a lot of social barriers that may have come along the way in order to right. get, make it through not only medical school, but post-medical school specialty stuff and to, you know, have some bedside manner with clients and, you know, that kind of stuff that they're, they kind of make into sort of this lovable bumbling kind of way on the good doctor, right? Um, that his bedside manner is less back there, right? Um, and, um, but yeah, I think it's interesting, Lauren, that you say too, that, um, oh, you lost my point. Um, I thought it was, um, that, he doesn't have a disability and he's playing a disability and I think there is an effort being made to have people with disabilities playing that character but it's still not widespread at all. I'm curious what, what folks thoughts are. Thoughts on that? That's widespread. Um, that, like, there's, I feel like there's some actors and actresses playing people with disabilities that actually have that disability. Um, like in the movie A Quiet Place, the actress in real life is deaf and she plays a character mm -hmm. who is deaf. Um, so I thought that was a nice mm -hmm. representation um, mm -hmm. that she actually had the disability that she was playing. But then also at the same time, I thought a lot about this question and I don't think that people with disabilities should be limited to the characters that also have their disability because that's not really why they became an actor or an actress. They love acting and they want to play a variety of characters, not just somebody that experiences the same um, disability that they do. And the same thing with people without a disability, they want to try to play the character to the best of their ability, whether they have a disability or not. Um, so I think they're all trying to do a good job at being an actor and obviously I'm not an actor or an actress so I don't know <laughs> like what really goes into it but I think that it is hard on both ways either if you have a disability and you're playing someone with a disability or if you're playing someone with a disability that you don't have I think that there's struggles in both situations and I'm not sure what the correct answer is. <laughs> That's such a good point. It's a real catch-22. I haven't thought about it that way. That's such a good angle to think about. It really is. Right, I think about how often when we talk about representation, it says, okay, I'm representing somebody you know, but the disability is the focus of that representation versus I have a disability and this is right. any number of characters that I may want to play and you know, have rehearsed and practiced just like anybody else to hone their craft. Thank you, Lauren. That I really think of all the things we've talked about, that's You're really happy. pertinent. Yeah. That's, I'm going to have to like kind of sit that for a little while too, because you're, you're totally yeah. right in, in both directions. So. Um. I think I've kind of seen that, and I don't know if you all have heard of 
the L word they have called the Generation Q. Um, and there is a female actress who um, is, is identifies as disabled. She has spinal muscular atrophy. Her name is Jillian Mercado. And she actually, like, there's no focus aside from, like, the challenges that she's facing in the storyline um, to some extent, right? Like, getting upstairs and things like that. Um, they haven't, like, focused anything really on, like, her disability or being in a wheelchair. She just, you know, is a character on the show. Um, so I kind of feel like it kind of touches upon that, like being able to just be a person with a disability playing a role that doesn't have to be all about the disability or be a focus on the disability. Whereas I feel like um, atypical, yeah. it's all about him and having autism, right? Um, so it's kind of starting to happen, which is pretty cool. Um, but again, mm -hmm. far, a few far in between, right? Very, very limited. Um, but as, again, somebody that has a physical disability, I, mm -hmm. it's really exciting. I'm like, this is awesome. I'm like super proud. Um, even if it's, again, very limited, it makes me very happy because when I was little, I, again, when I was thinking about like, when was the first time I ever saw somebody with a disability mm -hmm. on CD, I can't tell you like that it was this many. Um, or this common, and I know it's still again not much, but yeah. it's way we'll more than there's cool ever been. With American Sign Language going on, in terms of like you'll see like a, a video clip or something going around of like someone hopping in on a rap concert and hopping on stage and like signing the rap over. Um, you know, I think um, at the inauguration recently there was the signing of different. Um, the national anthem or maybe the beautiful it was something it was really lovely um and kind of seeing it kind of incorporated throughout um and, and making it just more standard um you know standard practice to have it's it's access but it also um you know gets us all accustomed to um seeing that there you know are different ways that people can get to communicate um which i think is is pretty neat um so um on the flip side, can anybody think of sort of a, a a time that they might have seen disability like inappropriately displayed or inaccurately displayed? Amy, you're nodding. I am because I was thinking about we've talked a lot about media in terms of like scripted serialized shows, but if I think about media from news broadcasts or sort of related mm -hmm. to crime, um, and I know some of the pieces we've been talking about are on invisibility invisible disability and somebody says like oh well they have this diagnosis and this crime as if there's necessarily a correlation or a relationship between you know what what somebody might be experiencing you know versus the action right. like that's took and a mass shooter I think that's so like fear and I think that a mental health or an autism diagnosis yeah. of some sort whether even if it's like a really far stretch in mm -hmm. terms of where, where we're really at. yeah yeah that's a that's a important thing that does kind of make the opposite of inspiration porn like what's i don't know what the remember what the term is but it's sort of the, the panic the panic form of things that make people afraid of you know disabilities and afraid of you know somebody who actually in most instances somebody with most of those diagnoses whether they have psychosis or other mental health type things or they have you know autism they're actually end up being a target of crime and a target of assault and you know other other things so in most instances they're actually not somebody that fear um they're actually a much more vulnerable population so i think you're right amy that um kind of blowing that out of proportion in terms of you know something bad that happens and making that the center piece of it can really skew societal's kind of views on something like that are there any other are there other times in like movie or media where you really didn't like the way something was portrayed. Like, I'm trying to think. I feel like often it's just, like, the poor, like, you know, person that, like, can't do something or that or they kind of mm -hmm. overcome this huge challenge, right? Um, so, I can't say something specific about being portrayed yeah. in a, like, I think, Lauren, what poorly. you said, though, just some sort of 
being mindful that the way any disability is being portrayed in one instance is in no way the way it is as an experience for mm -hmm. the wide variety of people. Um, and disabilities are really complex and they, you know, may have, there may be physical and invisible, um, you know, components to it, you know, that, that somebody may have various kind of things going on that are, are, are hard to represent and um, show. And I also would think like thinking about all the disparities um, and cultural identities, right? Mm -hmm. And how that also impacts a person and, and their disability. Um, so I think there's so many different factors that play in to it as well. Um, yeah. It further drills down to Lauren's point around people experiencing life yeah. differently, right? If we're talking about intersectionality and what other messages yeah. have you received from right your culture, your religion, your socioeconomic background, yeah. any number of those forces and right. how those forces may interact with, with your other life experiences. Mm -hmm. and that can be really, I think about it from our, I mean, anybody, but our students that are also navigating, you know, classes and growing up and as part of the pandemic, that's just a lot to peel back at, and sort of discover at the same time. And I feel like it plays into, you know, your personal advocacy for yourself, right? Um, your education, like the means to resources. There's just, that really kind of could really make a difference in one person's and experience versus gamut. another. We've got first generation college students. We've got students who come from many, many, many generations of college experience. And those that are non-traditional age students that may be coming with other things, or we, you know, people maybe have been temporarily abled and then and something happens to them that uh, in, a, in a disability evolves in some capacity or somebody was born with it or they've had it throughout their life and had different levels of access to treatment and care and skill building and you know all the different um, kind of things and so um, it, it really is um, you know there's so much and so layered in terms of it just would be impossible to totally capture in, in media but I think that are we feeling overall like the effort is there, keep going, um, is sort of kind of how we feel about it. Keep going, uh, uh, keep trying. Well, and I, I would be remiss not to mention my friends mm -hmm. at Sesame Street, um, because I keep thinking about, we're talking about media from an adult mm -hmm. standpoint or things, you know, it, when right. I think about how much of our worldview is created, at least our first sort of version of learning at a time where we don't realize like that's all messaging that's we just think what is is until we hit a time in life we said oh why do i think that you know one of the questions you'd ask me yeah. what's the first time i saw this or thought this um you know what will that be if we're doing this podcast you know again 20 years from now i i recently have a nephew he's like three and a half <laughs> months old and so i've been thinking a lot about you know the messages that he'll receive and what that looks like and i know that the even the characters on sesame street um our broadening representation and and how that will impact sort of the the landscape in a broader yeah, style. Yeah, they definitely are. I do think children's TV is is evolving and making a, a greater effort to represent across the board. I, I have a, a toddler and even just looking at the the books that and I am a little intentional about the books that we read, so I'm going to try to add lots of diversity factors into our family, but. <laughs> Um, but I still am seeing a lot of, you know, um, you know, when there's a lot of characters or kids in a classroom or in a book, you know, there's a lot of diversity, including dis including physical disability. It's harder to do invisible disabilities, but there are a lot of books about emotions and sort of being understanding of others and kind to of others. And so, yeah, I think that's a great point too, Amy, that we hopefully are, you know, paying attention to starting, you know, the children being a little bit knowledgeable with that. People are just people, right? Um, so, um, and we all start that way as kids. It's, it's sort of, things change over time. We all start that way. Um, you know, I think of like, I just saw the other day, it's been around for a long time, with this like meme that is like these two little boys and one's black and one's white and they were like, they got the same haircut to see if their teacher could tell them apart, you know, and it's so cute. And, you know, it's like, that's just what kids, you know, kids are kids, um, you know. Um, and so, you know, when that changes and how that changes, I think we can try to really continue to be intentional about making sure that there's, everybody's represented as people. So 
in sort of flipping things around a little bit, and we've talked touched on this a little bit, but um, and and Lauren, I think I'm gonna have you take a shot at answering this because it has a little bit in the disabled label category here. But if you had to kind of go for a definition or your own feelings on invisible disability, give it a shot. What would so, you say? To define invisible disability, I would say it's something that's not physical like when you look at somebody you can't tell that they have physical limitations or any physical disability but also like when you talk to them you can't really tell either it's usually pretty hidden until like say like you got to know someone better or like it comes out in academics a lot. I feel like a lot of invisible disabilities or your mental health. Um, I feel like a lot of invisible disabilities come out through those three things, either school, your mental health, or, um, I forgot, <laughs> or somebody telling you themselves. Mm -hmm. Getting to, right. know, getting to know them. Yeah. Yeah. So kind of when like stressful life factors kind of come exactly. into play, um, that, that's when things can play out too. Mm -hmm. How somebody might handle yeah. a lot to juggle, which we're all handling a lot to juggle right now, no matter how we look at it. Um, thanks. Yeah. Amy, do you have anything to contribute? Yeah, I was I was just thinking about the additional component of thinking, you know, how do you share that with somebody? When do you share that? The sort of difference in having to, you know, make that decision. I remember at the beginning of the pandemic, I was working with a new student and they were like, oh, you know, my physical disability is, you know, it feels invisible. And I had asked a couple other questions and had shared like, hey, I'm in a wheelchair, but nobody knows that, you know, I've never, um, which I know is a little different from, from your question, but it led me to think about somebody with an with an invisible disability, what that's like to, who do I tell? Who do I not tell? What services do I need? Why would I tell? Why wouldn't I tell? What's the impact? And so I just, I, I do a lot of work at the institution around bandwidth and just how much emotional energy life takes from a person in different ways and forms to Janelle's point earlier and all the different factors in somebody's life. And I thought, oh, that's just a different way of also looking at somebody's life experience, having to go through that process, you know, at a new school, at a new class, with a new roommate, at a new job. And I just kept thinking about all these other places where somebody mm -hmm. might have to think about disclosing and the per mm -hmm. what's the purpose, what's the benefit, what's the risk, you know, is somebody going to not like me for it, have bias, will I have, you know, issue or, hey, maybe I will be able to have a better experience. And how does anybody determine that? before they make the choice to share or not. It sounds like you're both kind of alluding to that there's 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 stigma across the board with disability, but there might be a little bit more of a layered complex stigma that comes along with hidden disabilities and invisible disabilities because you you do have to be more intentional in some ways about that whole revealing and conversation and asking for assistance and aids and what do you need and those kind of things but I'm, I'm, I don't want to say that that's what you're saying. But that's no I agree saying. with you. <laughs> Janelle what do you think about that? Amy I feel like yeah I was gonna say and I kind of agree like I definitely agree with Amy in terms of like this this constant like internal battle right like where who am i telling who is this affecting how is this affecting me in what spaces is this affecting me what is available to support me in these spaces um you know will, will there be preconceived notions about me will, will they believe, believe me time me, and time again right um <laughs> i think that comes up a lot as well right right exactly and i'm like I'm even wondering, like, you know, if students are facing this ever, you know, are, are faculty believing me, um, you know, when I'm saying I, I can't, you know, do something or whatever it might be. Um, and just how that can constantly impact a person's being, right? Um, overall, you know, going through that on a regular basis. Or people in general treat 
visible so. versus invisible disabilities differently. I agree that they're definitely treated differently. I think that like a physical disability, like people are more like, I don't know, like almost cautious in a way, like they don't want to like hurt their feelings or like they don't know what the right thing to say, like they don't, they feel like they're a different person just because they have the physical differences. Uh, but with invisible disabilities, I don't, I feel like people kind of say things that they might not realize they're talking to someone that has an invisible disability and they're just kind of like ignorant to think like, oh, well, if I can't see it, then it must not be there. But like we're saying now, that's mm -hmm. not true at all. But I also think that it's easier to kind of meet people and make those n new initial relationships with an invisible disability because that's not the first thing that people see. And unfortunately, I think that's a lot of the times what the first thing people see when meeting someone with a physical disability, where I wish that wasn't true, but it, I think it is um, still more common than not to have that initial um, like stigma almost that these that people with a physical disability are going to be a certain type of way. Mm -hmm. And there's also that stigma around mm -hmm. invisible disabilities that they're going to be a certain type of way. But you can also hide that when meeting new people um, if you have an invisible disability at first. That's just my opinion. <laughs> I really agree with Lauren because I keep thinking about everybody, and I've said this a bunch of times throughout the podcast, everybody has messages. So when a person interacts with somebody with a physical disability, it's like, this is what I think I know about somebody with a physical disability. They, you know, mm -hmm. will quote unquote, prove me right or prove me wrong, like unconsciously, not on purpose or, you know, in any active, you know, checklist sort of way. And then when I think about somebody with an invisible disability, how many times it may often be like, oh, I didn't know, or you don't seem like that person. And it's like, well, who was that person? Like you had the script in your mind of who that person is. And again, like how often this is our unconscious stuff, you know, from that everybody has to challenge those messages and, and learn. And be in a place where you have somebody to say like, hey, I had this thought today, or this came up for me. Um, I say this all the time. I was like, but nobody learns from a place of shame and blame. Like, people immediately shut down if that's the case um so how do people take responsibility for their own work and find those resources and find those people to talk to um, without ever assuming that you know a person with a disability is the person they should get all the resources right. from or like use some yeah we can't tokenize like anybody um, in any type of category right but it's it's complicated to figure out where do you you know where do we get the education where do we get the you know yeah. the ability to be you know understanding and open-minded you know, without saying you're, you're the one who teaches me. <laughs> and I think that comes with like experience, right? And being like around people with different disabilities, right? But how often are people around different people with different types of disabilities? So I think we all, again, and that's why, you know, this, I had put the disclaimer, this is all perspective. We all have our own perspective based off our own lived experience, right? Um, so like my experience as a person with a physical disability might be completely different to somebody else's experience um, with another physical disability or even an invisible disability, right? Um, we can agree, we can disagree, but I think it's just being kind of open to learning and to, again, like you said, Amy, kind of owning up to those kind of preconceived notions, thoughts, that biases that we might have based off of just things that we assume. So we're going to kind of wrap up today with things sort of that we're, what we're experiencing and learning. Is, you know, how do we support one another in inadvertently making assumptions or hurting people's feelings um, and that unconscious bias that, that comes up um, with any diversity category, but disability in particular, since that's why we're here today. Um, you know, and I think, um, you know, one of the things that I'm, I'm hearing 
I'm going to take a stab at sort of my thoughts on the answer because yeah, I, I strongly, strongly believe, and I am a strong, I'm the director of disabilities here, I'm a strong advocate for disabilities. I strongly believe that making mistakes are going to happen. It's about how you respond to the mistakes and how you make the repair and how you move forward and learn and grow. And, you know, there's no way around making mistakes. I can still probably make a mistake on a daily basis and can still grow every single day. And I've been in this field for like 20 years. Um, and, you know, so, you know, but that's, that has to be the core of how we can continue to, you know, be conscious of our efforts with others. So that's my, that's my two cents on how we can tackle this one. And people are afraid mm -hmm. of saying the wrong thing, so we say nothing. Mm -hmm. And nothing good has ever come mm -hmm. out of that. Yeah. Then there's just the questions remain, the unsureness mm -hmm. remains, the lack of resource sharing remains. And so wherever that right. is for somebody to say, where is where do I go? Whether that's attending a program, going to one of the offices and having a conversation with somebody, doing research on your own. You know, I think about like <laughs> that didn't exist. I, I feel like I keep aging myself in this space to, if, from that it's generation, true. but I had no internet growing up. And so I think about, yes, make sure your resources are reliable mm -hmm. and legit and all of that. But at the same time, I think there's mm -hmm. so many opportunities for people to seek out true knowledge from credible sources. Mm -hmm. Say, um, be an ally or be an advocate, depending on where you lie in terms of your relationship with disability. Um, and then also being okay with being uncomfortable. So I think often we are not okay. Mm -hmm. And I mean, personally too, I've been in situations where mm -hmm. I'm not comfortable being uncomfortable. And like you said, Amy, then I don't say anything, um, but it's okay to be uncomfortable and being open to learning and mm -hmm. being open to new experiences and, like, and new people who are and different and from us. Saying, you know, saying, like, if a person says that that doesn't make me feel comfortable or something like that, that, that actually takes courage. And that's a little bit, you know, there's something to be commended to even speak up and not just like let things go and let things lie. So, you know, being open-minded that it's not a criticism of you per se, they're, they trust you enough to have the dialogue and the conversation with you. So, you know, to take it as an asset and a growing point is to say, thank you for sharing that with me that I said that, or I did that, that wasn't, wasn't comfortable, you know? Um, I think that, you know, we try to take it with an open mind and, and say, I know now that thank you, you know, cause it was not, maybe not easy for them to say it or to say it for the millionth time to the millionth person about how they feel on that matter. Um, so we have, and I'm going to let Janelle ask it, but we're going to ask in every podcast, we're going to ask sort of a final wrap up question. So we're going to end with that today. Yeah. So today's final question is, after this conversation, what is the takeaway that will stick with you? And has anything changed about how you feel as a person with a disability or an ally about disability stigma. So the first part is what's your takeaway? And the second part is how do you feel as a person with a disability or as an ally about disability how do you stigma? Feel now about, yeah, about stigma. I think my major takeaway is actually from Lauren's point earlier, and I know we we're talking about media specifically, but um, you know, really thinking about when interacting with someone, supporting somebody, thinking about the policies and just all of the work we do as professionals, you know, that somebody experiencing or having mm -hmm. a disability is part of someone's identity, but that may or may not be what they came to talk about. You know, what are the assumptions that says, you know, if somebody shows up, you know, what what's most salient in the experience right now? It may or may not have anything to do with that disability. Um, and so what does that mean for the way that teams, um, process, what kind of supports we offer. So I'm going to be thinking about that and sitting with that for a while. Um, mm -hmm. I know we mentioned it specifically around the media, but I was like, oh, that really applies to life in general, um, which I guess is maybe some of the better parts of media. So you take that information to process. Um, I think how I feel, I feel hopeful. I think I, you know, it's whether it's pandemic related or not, having a chance to be with other people to have these conversations in different pockets in the university, because I think it's easy to mm -hmm. say like, oh, mm -hmm. I care about this thing and I'm doing it here. Um, 
you know, especially having students and other other staff, you know, as part of those processes and in our own um, spheres. Yeah, that's good. Like, look forward to more partnering. Thanks so much for both of you for being here today and being our inaugural podcast. I don't even think we bumbled through that much. <laughs> Thank you to anyone who was listening to <laughs> sticking with us. A big, big um, thank yeah. you. <laughs> I was like, what is <laughs> No. <laughs> Any more fun y'all. topics uh, that are just kind of interesting and full of kind of neat little, as Amy said, pockets of stuff to talk about. So.